The official trailer for War of the Rohirrim just dropped and I decided to make a little trailer analysis here. I think this is the first footage of the actual film that comes out in December that we so far have seen. I think today was a sm very small teaser on Twitter already, but I think before this we had only some stills and some concept art published. For those not aware, that will be an anime film that is also produced or drawn in Japan. And I think it's an interesting combination putting Tolkien slash Lord of the Rings and anime together. I think there were also in the past some kind of classic high fantasy anime like Record of Lord of War from the 90s that was, if I remember correctly, or that franchise was inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. And Dungeons and Dragons is also inspired by Tolkien. So I guess that was already also distantly inspired by Tolkien and Lord of the Rings as well. But I guess that's a different topic. My name is Chris, aka The Philosopher's Games, and let us look into the trailer and I will give you some information on what we see in the trailer based on my knowledge of the books. So there is definitely a little spoiler warning here. The story is about King Helm Hammerhand and his house and we can find that in Appendix A of The Lord of the Rings. In Appendix A we have like a lot of lore and background stories. It's not a full fleshed out novel though what Tolkien wrote down there. It's just like a few paragraphs that summarizes what happened in these ancient times round about 250 years before the events of the Lord of Rings. Let's say almost 300. That's potentially more accurate. The beginning of that story we already see in the trailer. We see Helm, King of Rohan, sitting in Meduselt. We know that also from the Lord of the Rings films and books. That is the hall where the King of Rohan resides. And next to him we see two young men sitting that I assume are his sons, Harles and Hama. And then on the other side the red-haired woman that is I assume his daughter. Here in the anime she is called Hera. Not sure about the meaning. Her could mean something like noble, excellent, honorable, something like that. But Hera could also mean in Old English something like uh, somebody who obeys order, servant, follower. Maybe it's a play on words a bit because she has maybe to follow the orders of her father but also she's noble. Something like that and depending on her action this might be then explored further in the film. Who knows? However, one day two men appear in Meduselt and that are Freka and his son Wolf. They ask for the hand of Helm's daughter. Freka is an interesting character because he claims to be related to the noble house of Rohan, so also one of the Rohirrim, but his ancestors mingled with the Dune landings and he's also like a lord in a region further west closer to Duneland. And that's kind of interesting because the Dune landings are actually related to the people of Rohan and to the people of Gondor, but the people of Gondor and the people of Rohan don't know that. And that has some law reasons why they don't know this. The main reason is basically that back in the past the Dunedain did not recognize the language of the Dune landings and thought okay we can't be related with them. That was different for the Norsemen which also the people of Rohan are part of. And so they were accepted as kin, the Dune landings not. And then they pushed the proto dune landings to the further to the east to the misty mountains and basically drove them out of their land and then they became the dune landings what is important is that this action led to that the dune landings are not the hugest fans of gondor now rohan is allied with a dune dine of gondor as a result the friends of the foes of duneland are still foes i guess and so I could imagine that the relationship between Duneland and Rohan was not the best. However, there was this one person, Freka, who had the blood of both in them. And I think the move to marry Helm's daughter to his son Wolf was kind of one to overcome this feud, if that makes sense. King Helm was not a fan of this proposal. And then this led to an argument between both. And there Helm punched Freka so hard in the face that he just died on the spot. And from this day on Helm is called Helm Hammerhand. 
All this we see in the trailer and I'm very curious how they explore some of the background information that I just gave you or if they kind of have to reduce this to a bare minimum. Who knows what they are going for in this film, but it definitely is important to understand where this proposal comes from. And after that, Wolf, of course, wears revenge and it leads to conflict, which has its peak at this famous mountain fortress, which is back in the day just called Thusburg, Salzburg, and later will be called during this event Hornburg. Hornburg. There are some scenes, like the first scene we see in the trailer, hints at this already, and we see the snow, the long winter is also a big topic of this conflict. The long winter was an extreme winter that led also to famine. And interestingly, in this time, Gandalf comes to the Shire to aid the hobbits there. And it is in this time he grows fond of them, which will later result in him selecting Bilbo for the quest for Erebor. So it's a fascinating time where everything is well connected. I also made a video about this specific time once as part of my Who's Elrond series. I'll link it in the description if you are interested in learning all about this time. Coming now back to the trailer, I think what I just explained the beginning of the story, you can definitely already see in the trailer. If they now flash this out, give it a bit more time and give the proper background information, then it would be pretty awesome to see on the big screen seeing this in this film. And it's also pretty low accurate so far. There are some other interesting scenes in the trailer I want to briefly talk about. For example, when Helm and Freka punch each other, we have a scene where we see Helm's daughter and a man standing to her left. I could imagine that this is Freyalaf Hilde's son, that is her cousin, and also a very important character for this story, at least later on. Then to her right, we see a woman, and I could imagine that that is actually Hild, the sister of Helm and the aunt of Hera and then also the mother of Freyalaf. Also there's another scene, a flashback and I guess we see Hera and Wolf, so it seems they know each other and they're maybe going for this trope. We were once friends but later become foes. That is not too unusual in anime, I guess. In this context, it also seems that the daughter of Helm, Hera, might be the protagonist or the main character of this film, which is very interesting. In the book, it is, of course, that there we have this historic perspective form from it. It's like a summary of what happened back then. It's the law of that time, so to say. And there, the daughter of Helm is not even named. She is basically, let's call it a story device for the conflict of Helm, Freka and Wolf. But now it seems they are telling the story from her perspective, I could imagine. That's an interesting decision. Knowing the story as a whole, it's not easy to tell it from Helm's perspective. I mean, it would be possible to some degree, of course, but it would be a very one-sided perspective. And I think a different character's main character might give a better perspective. I mean, the other option would be from the perspective of Freyalaf, but that is also a character that only becomes important later in the story. As a result, there would be, I guess, some parts missing. So the decision to go with the daughter of Helm is, in my opinion, actually a smart one. I can definitely see this working. And of course, I could also imagine that they want to, let's call it reference, Eowyn from The Lord of the Rings. And then there is the, pun intended, elephant in the room. The olifants are also shown in the trailer. We have already seen them on concept arts before. And that is kind of a controversial topic. It's a small detail because in the text in Lord of the Rings, no olifants were mentioned while Edoras is attacked by Wolf and the Dune Landings. But if you look into the book, we can read... It was soon known that Wolf was their leader. They were in great force, for they were joined by enemies of Gondor that landed in the mouths of Lefnui and Eason. So they are stretching the line 
for they were joined by enemies of Gondor by quite a bit in my opinion, because Gondor had a massive amount of foes. There were all kinds of tribes of Easterlings, the Hillmen, the Corsairs of Umbar, the entities or creatures, people and so on of Mordor. Then of course we also have the Haradrim, that are those with the Oliphants, and also the Dune Landings, I think I didn't mention, which potentially also had many different tribes. So in my opinion Tolkien meant probably one of those others that are not Oliphants. I guess they are doing this for fan service reasons, which is okay and fine. I just wanted to point that out, not that anybody wonders, wait, Edoras was once attacked by Oliphants? No, not according to the books, at least it's never explicitly mentioned. There's one instance where a later king of Rohan, Folkwine, sends his two sons and an army to help Gondor and fulfilling their oaths of course, and at that time Gondor was attacked by the Haradrim, so here the people of Rohan could have made first experience fighting Oliphants, I guess, but like I said, that's a later king, round about 105 to, I don't know, 140 years after the story of Helm Hammerhand. And those battles were in Gondor, more to the south, so very far away from Rohan. Another detail, obviously, because it has to do with the Oliphant, is the appearing of the Watcher in the Water, so this, let's call it Octopod. And this time he's at least green, so that fits the book lore a bit better, but I have no idea what he has to do there or why he eats an Oliphant. Who knows? That is a bit strange. They're also great eagles. If I remember correctly, the great eagles were not really present in the story as well, but at least if you go further to the north, to the misty mountains and so on, you know that some great eagles might be around there. So yeah, it's not too far-fetched. It is possible that there were some great eagles. The significance of that one that we see here and the contact with the daughter of Helm I can't foretell, but I guess it will play a part in the story. Maybe she's sent to get some help because there is a siege of the Hornburg, the Hornburg, and they try to send for help and let's say stuff develops from there. I don't want to spoil too much here. And of course at the end we have this scene where some person, some creature, some entity is searching for rings. And that kind of makes sense because at some point Sauron starts looking for rings again. So you could make the argument it potentially fits in exactly this time. And he potentially sends out his subordinates to go out into the world and find rings for him. And he had a huge collection there but potentially has not found the ring Sauron is looking for. It would at least in my opinion fit into this time because this is 300 years after the Watchful Peace and there Sauron's will to find the One Ring is definitely there. I also wonder if the sword of Helm's daughter Hera will be Herogrim because there is no law when it was forged or what its origin story is so the writers there would have a lot of freedom and maybe that's like a cool reference for later then because they have the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings license and they even show some Peter Jackson 2 Towers footage at the beginning of the trailer to potentially make it clear that this is its own thing connected to the Lord of the Rings adaption from Peter Jackson and not for example to the Amazon show. For final words, so I have to say I'm positively surprised by the trailer. Very curious what they do with this and from my perspective as a huge book fan, if you know Appendix A well and the text well, you definitely see the plot points and can see how this plays out. You also notice of course some minor changes here and there as mentioned. It's told from a different perspective I guess, but Overall, I'm very curious what they do with this and this has, in my opinion, huge potential. You, of course, have to like anime and um, the art style of it. That's very individual. I personally like the art style um, that we see here, so I can live with it. It is not the best quality anime animation I have ever seen, to be honest, but for me, it's okay. And I hope... It will be a great film that portrays this very cool story, which is also among my favorite, let's call it, law stories of Tolkien from that time, from the Third Age. Thank you for watching.
I hope you enjoyed this little analysis video for the War of the Rohirrim official trailer and if you liked it feel free to press the like button, maybe leave me a comment and tell me what you have seen in the trailer, how you liked the art style, the animation, what your thoughts are, maybe what I have missed and for more lore content maybe press the subscribe button as well, would be much appreciated. Also huge shout outs to all my supporters, and memberships and all the things you do, much much appreciated. The mentioned Amazon show is also starting soon and I will cover it here on the channel so if you want to have more analysis videos that focus on what is in the books and what's different in the show. I try to be as neutral there as possible, sometimes it's difficult to be honest, but I try. Then maybe check that out as well, there's also games content I'm currently working on. It's just a very busy month that you will find on the games channel though. Again, thank you for watching and see you people next time, goodbye.